You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is Rahm Emanuel with David Axelrod for Chicago Stories. David, uh, we've known each other a long time. But long enough that you know that I'm not from Chicago originally. Actually, there's question one. <laughs> so th- th- this is not going to be... But then tum- neither are you. Yeah, but I want to make sure that you understand. Hey, get, you're getting close there, buddy. Uh, this is not going to be a Talmudic session. So okay. we actually... Questions get answers, not questions, okay? Oh, right, I know fine. that's going to be hard for okay. you. Actually, what brought you to Chicago? And the other piece of which I think is interesting for people is your mother was a journalist. Mm-hmm. Your father, if I remember this Psychologist. right. Psychologist. Yes, but also fled the pogroms. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So what brought you here, and how did the, how did your parents influence you? And remember, we have only about 20, 30 <laughs> minutes. So if you can leave out your kindergarten years, that would be shorten this <laughs> All right. for us. All no, right, seriously. so first grade. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I came to Chicago because uh, I was looking at, to go to college after uh, high school, and I, when I was considering colleges— um, First of all, my homeroom teacher, I grew up in New York City, and my homeroom teacher at Stuyvesant High School, uh, Jerry Liebner, said, <laughs> pick a school that's at least 600 miles outside of, uh, drawn on a map, 600 miles away from New York, and your parents will never surprise you with a visit because they'll have to buy a plane <laughs> ticket. And I thought, well, there's a little bit of wisdom. But I wanted, I wanted to go to school in a city, and I wanted to go to school in a city that, ha- that had rich politics because I was interested in politics from an early age. And Chicago had just had this Democratic convention in 68. Mayor Daley was still sitting in this office where we're sitting now. Uh, and He's uh, still here. <laughs> I bet he <laughs> yeah. is. I bet he is. I got to watch what I say. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, and running the last of the big city machines. And uh, Hyde Park, where the university was, was the uh, seat of what was the beginnings of a black independent political movement. And I thought, this would be an interesting place to be. So as much as anything, politics, and, and obviously the University of Chicago is a great university, and I knew that. Um, so uh, for all those reasons, I came to Chicago, but never expected to stay. You asked me about my parents. I mean, my mother's influence in journalism, like she said she named my sister and me to, uh, so that our names would look good in bylines. I don't, you like to think you have free Wait, will. Was your mother Jewish by chance? <laughs> you like to think <laughs> you have free will. Only your mother could plan that. Not, uh, <laughs> there, that was, it's embarrassing yeah. to be honest with you. But I'm a big enough person to admit it. Uh, and um, I just want to know, it dispels the belief that she was thinking Dr. Axelrod. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> you want no. to buy David yeah, Axelrod. And, uh, but I really went into journalism because when I get to, went to the University of Chicago, um, you know, no one there at that time wanted to talk about anything that happened after the year 1800. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to explore politics in Chicago, so I started doing it as a as a journalist. You know, I'm sure my dad's experience um, a, as a um, refugee, which is what he was, um, makes me much more uh, appreciative of the freedom that we have here. And I always remind myself of his experience when I feel like maybe I'm, or others are taking for granted uh, what he didn't have as a as a child, you mm-hmm. know, the freedom of worship, freedom of speech, the opportunity to make a living, personal safety, and so on. You know, I mean, obviously, you're known, obviously, for your work on campaigns and stuff, but you actually care about, and I know this, and you only work for certain candidates. I know how my grandfather— I mean, an exception in your case. I, 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 was, I was a writer. <laughs> uh, uh, but I know how my grandfather's experiences of somebody that left the pogroms influenced how I feel about politics and stuff. Mm-hmm. And how do you watch what's going on today about immigrants, refugees, and the dialogue? Did you ever think as the son? Well, I mean, you know, I, I will say this, Ram, and you, I think, prob- you, you may have been there, but um, when we were working in the White House, we were in Moscow in 2009 and uh, standing in a you know honor guard or whatever it is the Mm -hmm. line of dignitaries and they were playing our national anthem which always moved me when we were on foreign soil Mm -hmm. and heard our anthem saw our flag but now we're back in eastern europe 
And it happens to be the anniversary. Uh, it would have been my father's 99th birthday mm. or the day before his 99th birthday. And I started thinking about him and what they went through to get to America and the fact that America opened its arms to them. And I was so, and here I was, the senior advisor to the president of the United States. And it really said, you know, I, I had tears in my eyes mm -hmm. about that uh, at that moment, uh, even as I had my hand over my heart uh, while the anthem was playing. Um, yeah, I, uh, I am deeply, deeply disturbed because I think one of the great things about America is that we've welcomed people from all over the world. And one of the great things about America is that people from all over the world want to come here. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is a uh, violation of the character of our country uh, to uh, deny that. And, um, you know, I think over time uh, this will pass. But right now, it's a it's a really sorry episode in our right. history. Yeah, you have a. And by the way, two years before my father got, two years after he got here, there was this draconian uh, immigration bill in 1924 mm -hmm. that would have prevented him. That set up very strict quotas, uh, really aimed at keeping immigrants out, and particularly Jewish immigrants and so on. It's one of the reasons why not more escaped uh, the Holocaust to come here. So yeah, well, there's a. Dalek's new book on FDR I just read and putting Breckenridge Long in charge of implementing that also wasn't helpful mm -hmm. in that history. Uh, there's another story I'll one day, um, I know that feeling because I, when I walked off the plane with President Obama in Israel mm -hmm. and you stand as a part of the official delegation. Yeah. It's a, it, 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 first of all, we should say both of us, yeah. it's an incredible privilege. It's an incredible privilege to represent the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And it also was working for President Obama and all he represented, mm -hmm. you know, to be part of that in Israel yeah. and elsewhere was really a really a great experience. When, since you ridiculed wor working for me as a writer, <laughs> as a writer but honestly, what do you look for, uh, David, when you, you've worked for President Obama, mm -hmm. but you've worked for Rich Daley, you wor mm -hmm. worked with me, other candidates, a different governor, et cetera. What do you look for and wh why do you look for that in a sense? Not well, the first question I always ask is, why do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. And if people can't give me a cogent answer, then my conclusion is they shouldn't run and I shouldn't work for mm -hmm. them. And I've made that decision uh, uh, in, in, in cases. Um, so I want to know why someone wants the job. And it's not enough that this is going to be another slot on my career advancement. But... I want people who have passion for public service, passion for what they can do with that uh, mm -hmm. position. M my thing is uh, I can communicate a message, but that message has to flow from who someone actually is. Mm -hmm. If there isn't a there there, then I really can't do my job. So uh, all kidding aside, you asked me, I remember you asking me when you thought about running for Congress, do you think... I can win. And I said, I know you'll win. And I knew that you would win because I knew that you, uh, first of all, what motivated you, why you wanted to run. And I knew you'd work harder than anybody else. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I spent a lot of time when I was a, I mean, early in your career, you uh, are a little more expansive in your, <laughs> in your, in the candidates you accept because you're trying to build a business. But very quickly, I realized that if you're going to be successful, better to work with candidates who's who have an authentic story that you can uh, believe in you mm -hmm. know? let me but you uh one of the things i think that powerful for you is and i've heard you talk about this when do you think that the personal narrative of an individual candidate became a more dominating than their not their more dominating their ideas but a way of telling that story you know i'm not sure that it's it's, I don't you know, know that there was a light bulb moment. No, but. no, but I, I think that, like with everything, um, the, some of this changes with the changing of media and how we communicate. But remember, I mean, all through American history, uh, you know, Tippecanoe and Tyler, too, uh, Honest Abe, mm -hmm. you know, uh, George Washington and the character. Right. I mean, their personal stories... Uh, were central to their narrative. And I just think that if you're going to communicate an authentic story, it should flow from uh, biography. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, that um, 
You know, in your campaign, I remember when you ran for Congress, there were two things that stood out to me. One was that your father had been a pediatrician. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess there were three. There were, your father had been a pediatrician on the northwest side and had uh, helped birth a lot of the uh, children and uh, take care I of a lot of the children. I think two wards worth. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, uh, another was that your uncle had mm-hmm. been a police sergeant on the northwest side for decades. But, and the third was, I think, that you're, actually your own immigrant experience, you, you haven't, there's no doubt you have a feel for the ethnic character of our city, mm-hmm. and uh, in the best sense of the word. I mean, one of the great things about Chicago is its diversity. Everybody's proud of where they, from where they came, and um, it makes for a really rich community. You got all of that, and that your district certainly reflected that diversity. Let me go back to one thing as you brought up, uh, immigrant back up. What was the moment you remember most from Obama? And I know that's hard because it's, we both serve a lot. And what was, I suppose, things that if you could rewrite it again, you would go do? You mean in government? Yeah. Well, the, the most, uh, I will never, ever forget the night the Affordable Care Act mm-hmm past because, um, uh, as you know, I have a child with a chronic Mm -hmm. illness, epilepsy, uh, and we uh, almost went bankrupt when she was young, and I was a reporter um, uh, because of all of the expenses, and I knew how much the system needed to be uh, reformed. I also was, as as we both were, concerned mm-hmm. about the political costs of doing it and admired the president for doing it. But I, the night that it passed, I went into my office and um, closed the door and uh, and I sobbed. I didn't. Uh, I wanted to do it out of your sight there. I didn't want to embarrass mm-hmm. you. <laughs> uh, but I sobbed because. Um, I knew that uh, other families wouldn't have to go through what my family went through. And I went and found our boss, uh, the president, and I thanked him for that. And he said, that's why we do the work. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a parable about public service. You have this unparalleled opportunity to do things that touch people's lives in a really positive way. And uh, that, to me, crystallized the whole experience, Mm -hmm. that one moment. Um, what what you could do over G, I mean, you know, um, there. I was the communications guy in the first two years, and there are probably a myriad ways in which I would have uh, handled things a little bit differently. I'm not sure that our narrative, we were so busy trying to bail the country out from an economic crisis mm-hmm. that it was hard to get a consistent uh, narrative uh uh, going, be, uh, you know, that that, that really uh, touched people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, we used to mock uh, President Bush when he said he couldn't think of mistakes that he had made. Um, and, uh, you know, and everybody was helpful in pointing mm-hmm. them out, and I'm sure people are helpful in pointing ours out. But, you know, you do the best you can, and uh, you learn from it. But um, you don't sit there and dwell on the things that, you should have done. You do the best you can. I guess, uh, you know, one moment I, I don't I think you'll remember this is, I also think one moment that I always felt captured President Obama and his courage was going against the me- meeting we had on the auto industry. And yes. everybody yeah. saying no. And he said, yes, if we're in, we're in for everything. Right. I thought it was an incredible. That was well. That day, I don't know how much you remember about that day, but we started off. I was in my room before off, in the meeting, crying. <laughs> you, you, you were, uh, you were, you started off before I did because you sat in on some of his, uh, some of the security briefings that I wasn't in. But there was some concern about North Korea, yes. the problem that never ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, that pushed our auto meeting back. The auto meeting wasn't long enough for him to really get all the information he needed, so he adjourned that until the evening. Mm -hmm. Then he had uh, a town hall on the economy, and then he had a meeting on Afghanistan, a meeting on Iraq, both of which you probably were in. And then, just then, we... uh, we have the meeting on uh, autos, which went on for an hour and a half. In the Roosevelt think, Room. In the Roosevelt Room. I, it, I remember, I'm sure the room was lit. In my memory of that meeting, it was very dark because it just this seemed is weird. so— This Okay, the opposite. 
I remember it almost like there were ca camera lights on the table. Maybe we were at different meetings. Yeah. Well, I was at the one where he decided to go <laughs> to save GM and Chrysler. Maybe you. But here's the other thing so I remember. I went back to the office uh -huh. and I was exhausted. And I remember him telling me that day after that one, those two meetings on Afghanistan and Iraq, saying, "I got to confess, I'm I'm tired." Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I went back to the office after that meeting. I just collapsed in my chair, and the phone rang, and it was you. And you said, get in here, Fargo's underwater. <laughs> there was flooding in Fargo. And I thought to myself, what is this, an episode of the West Wing? <laughs> is it, this, is not, this can't be true. We had to send the OEMC team in. Right. Yeah. It was a, but I remember going around the table, and I want to be, this is, and everybody saying either, okay, save GM, forget Chrysler, or don't do it at all. And I forgot who in the back corner. Like, it wasn't even at the full table with all the quote unquote adults. He says, if we're in, we're in. And the President of the United States against almost across the board advice. Except for two guys who I remember very, very well Gene Sperling, who, who was it? from Michigan, right? And was very passionate about what it would mean to to let these companies go and uh and robert gibbs who had worked there uh, the press secretary who had worked there for debbie stabenow the senator who said you know sir that some of these towns already are going through a depression uh yeah, because this would be crushing if you do you remember who said at the table yeah uh, because actually that was the first time i remember the word depression was used so we all talk about it as recession Right for these towns, this I think is it was like, Robert. These are Robert. ongoing depressions yeah. now. This is this is that it was Robert, who I um, uh, I, was, I was just with him uh, the other day for the uh, uh, an event around the uh, anniversary of the Iowa caucuses mm -hmm. that Obama won, um, and I uh, and I was reminded of how uh, you know w w everybody thinks of Robert as a hard bitten kind of. The press guy who, with a chippy attitude toward mm. and fending off the reporters and everything, but within the councils of government, he was a very passionate voice, Big time. and uh, that was true when Obama was in the Senate and uh, when Robert was in the White House with him. But yeah, Robert was the one who said that. One other thing I would say, one Sharon, I do want to get back to some politics is I always tell people about. They said, "What was it like, etc.?" And I tell them how special it is my favorite anecdote was our helicopter ride the president you and i and ellie wiesel yes to dachau yes you should share yeah well to because Buchenwald, i think, that, to Buchenwald. To Buchenwald, I think yeah. that reminds everybody of what we talked about being sons of two of either immigrant refugees or grandparents yeah well it was this, it was only his second visit ellie wiesel who had been of course held in buchenwald his father died there um he uh, it was only his second visit back there president asked him to go uh and um uh, i remember two things about it one was um flying we we, we drove and then took marine one there mm -hmm. and uh i said to him uh i said to ellie i said um, think about the first time you came here this is in the blade just car. starting yes the, 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 think of the, the, how it was the first time you came here, and now you're returning on a on a helicopter with the president of the United States, and who, who's a black man. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, you know, maybe history has a sense of justice. And he said, I don't know if history has a mm -hmm. sense of justice, but it certainly has a sense of humor. He said, God has a sense of humor. Yeah. Right. And we, we all thought we heard it wrong, and so we took the yeah. uh, the things you put over your ears to muffle the blades yeah and we all kind of leaned in as he in that i accent. also remember you asking him if he felt uncomfortable because uh chancellor merkel was going to yeah. be there if he felt uncomfortable and he said something that i think was so profound he said the children of murderers are not murderers and you know the, his his capacity for uh forgiveness uh was extraordinary given what he had been through uh he was a he was a great man yeah I, let me switch gears because you were a journalist. What do you think is happening to that profession today from the day that you start? I, I know we have only I think it's six the, hours. the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> give me the, give the, me, the, the best of times is that, uh, you know, the, there's a reason that the First Amendment is the First Amendment mm -hmm. and that a free press was so central to the vision of the founders of our democracy. And that is that the role of the 
the news media, the mm-hmm. free press, was to shine a bright light in dark corners and hold our leaders accountable. I think that's happening. Uh, certainly it's happening at the national level uh, in a way that's important. And, you know, n- neither of us loved every story that was written about Obama. Some of them weren't well done. A lot of them were, but they were uncomfortable for us. But I never found myself saying, boy, we'd be better off if these people weren't here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, what's a little disquieting about what you hear out of the White House today is this sense of, uh, of, of uh, identifying the, the media writ large as an enemy of the people mm-hmm. uh, because they write things that are inconvenient to the leaders. That's antithetical to our democracy. So I think at the national level, you're seeing a lot of really good reporting. I think at the local level, local news organizations have been depleted. When I started the Chicago Tribune, it was a robust newsroom. Uh, they had they had been on a recruiting binge, and some of the great reporters in America were there. Uh, we were given largely free reign to pursue good stories, but lots of oversight and supervision. And when I was a young reporter, that was really important. I learned about journalism from great journalists. Uh, that whole strata of editors and so on has been depleted. You're down to uh, a much uh, less robust uh, budget. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of good reporting that still goes on at the local level, but the local news, news organizations are struggling and in many cases failing. And I think that that is a, uh, that's a loss for the country. Um, and then, you know, there's the X factor, which is Trump. And one of the dangers I see for journalism is that he draws journalists into contests on Twitter uh, that draw journalists out of the role they should play, which is to be uh, reporters of truth as best as truth can be ascertained and not as commentators or advocates. And uh, I think most of the people who cover the White House and cover Washington, they play that role uh, well. Some uh, don't, and they lend credence to his, uh, line, to of his line of attack, yes. One thing I would just say, do you think people default too much to cable and Twitter and social media, that that's the reason this has become... Yeah, a, I mean, I, I should I, have said that. I mean, I had something, this quaint thing called news cycles, where, you know, a newspaper <laughs> would come out every day, and in between you had a chance to actually report, contemplate, reflect on what you were doing. The pressures on reporters today is so enormous because there are no news cycles. Everything, every, any, as soon as someone has a story, it goes up online. Everyone has to compete with that story. And there are pressures to cut corners Mm -hmm. to get that story up. And I do think that that, and you know, the cable mentality, every, you know, um, Uh, everything's breaking news, everything is hyped because there's such a competition to get eyeballs that um, some, you know, not not everything is an enormous story. But I've always said that in Washington today, and it was true when we were there, you know, every day is election day, everything's enormous, everything's the decisive story of this administration, everything's going to determine the next election. And almost always that was not true. Now, it's a little different now because there are such huge stories going on. But even those are some are some are really important and some are not. But everything gets hyped. So in that sense, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a it's a much more difficult time to be a reporter than when I was a reporter. Let me I know I want to be sensitive to your Mm -hmm. time. Not really. But I'm being very sensitive to it. I got two. I've got an aide here who is sensitive yeah. to my yeah, time. Yeah, I noticed that because the aide is on the clock right there looking. <laughs> you've you've helped elect Harold Washington, Rich Daly, mm-hmm. Rahm Emanuel. Uh, what has changed? Who did I like best? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, okay. And I like you too best. Okay. okay, now our little bromance is over. Okay, what has changed and what hasn't changed both about politics in the city? And what uh, and and the city government, and then I got one closing that's essential to the well-being of the city. Well, look, um, you know, I, I have to go back a little bit further because I was a reporter uh, when at the end of Richard J. Daley, through Michael Balandic, through Jane Byrne, and the very very mean, uh, uh, meaningful election of two thousand of nineteen eighty three right. when Harold Washington right. became uh, elected as the first African American mayor. That was. That was warp speed change in right. the politics of our city 
um, ending in the uh, the invitation, not the invitation. I shouldn't say that, but 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 essentially the African American community claiming its rightful place at the table exactly. after having been subjugated to the Democratic uh, machine. After Harold died in 1987, very tragically, um, uh, there was a period of absolute chaos in the city, racial anger and, uh, you know, just, you know, Beirut on the lake is what uh, the Wall Street Journal called Chicago at the time. Um, Rich Daly came in and um, really his he should be remembered for having uh, helped uh, reunite the city. Uh, I always remember he got 7% of the African-American vote when he first ran. Uh, he, he, you know, in each succeeding election, he got more. Uh, and just by stressing uh, that we were one city mm-hmm. was really, really important. Obviously, he did other things in terms of his vision uh, of the city, his aesthetic vision of the city, uh, which it was historic. Um, but the... the uh, but the politics, you know, were defined when I got here by the hegemony of the Democratic Party and the Democratic organization. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is not the case anymore, really. Uh, what is still true is that we've got we're a city of neighborhoods and therefore our politics very much is still mm-hmm. a neighborhood politics. These aldermen represent mm-hmm. distinctive communities. They have distinctive concerns. We've got an ethnic flavor still to parts of our city. And yes, we still have divisions that uh, exist, but the politics of the city are more uh, are more open now mm-hmm. uh, than they were certainly when I arrived here. And um in the years before Harold was uh, mayor, two qu- uh, quick questions. I know you're a fl- you love food and cuisine. What's your favorite? Do dish? I have something? At- no, my- oh, you're okay. not wearing you're right. not wearing the mustard um, uh, from okay. lunch today. Yes, yeah. What's your favorite dish at Manny's? Uh, well, my favorite dish is the corned beef sandwich, which I don't have as much as I'd like to anymore. There's but I mean, mo- it's been forty years yeah. so, <laughs> that I've been going there. I like their matzo ball soup. And what's your other question? Uh, well, you and I have a philosophy. And turkey legs, of course, yes, every I, Wednesday. You have For those have... who don't know, every Wednesday, <laughs> turkey legs the size of of clubs. Uh, That's actually for Jewish meals where you beat your uh, family relatives with when yeah, you're done. Well, yeah, only when you're done. There was a great quote. So I'm, as you know, with Zach, my son, I always talk about, um, we're talking about politics in, in this new Bobby Kennedy biography. And I thought it captured yours and my kind of, so Larry Tye book? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great book. That John Kennedy was a realist wrapped in a romantics uh, package, and Bobby Kennedy was uh, a romantic wrapped in a realist package. Yeah, I think that's true. And I actually think well, one of the things I try to give to Zach is you have to be idealistic enough to know why you're running for office or serve in office, and then ruthless enough to want to get it done. Yeah. Well, you know, I think JFK in many ways reminded me, if you had one president who would remind me of Barack Obama, it would be John F. Kennedy, because Obama had the ability to inspire. Mm -hmm. He had that romanticism Mm -hmm. about him, but he was very pragmatic. uh, And I think people uh, don't appreciate that. I mean, those were the two elements of him. Bobby Kennedy was, after his brother was killed, he I mean, he was Don Quixote, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, and uh, and he was ruthless, and in the sense that he knew how to get things done, and right. that was the role. But he became much more the the crusader after his uh, after his brother died. But I, I think you're quite right. You need both. Yeah, people's. you need both. You need to have that passion and that belief, but you also need to know how to get things done. Otherwise, you're just tilting at windmills. Yeah, this recent book I read by Dalek on FDR captures, I think, that pragmatism with a sense of commitment to why. Very much. Are. He very much so. All right, quick round. So you're on time. Is it the lake or the river? The is lake fact, or is, the river? The yeah. lake. Yeah. Okay. Socks or Cubs? That I'm, I, I'm a New no. Yorker. I don't have to pick tribal. Yeah. I do not have to choose. I have seasons tickets on both sides of town. I love baseball. I, I, it's, you're like asking me to choose between a, my children. Okay, go ahead. Pick. 
No. Yes. No, I'm not going to do I'll it. I'll do it for you. I mean, you I, grew up, no, I, I, knew, I, I grew knew, up as a National yeah, League I'll guy. I'll do it for you because I, I, I'm going to do it Here's my me. prediction. The Sox are going, are ascendant, and we'll be celebrating a Sox championship sometime in the next few years. Okay. You are like a weasel. You would never okay. have allowed anybody else to do oh, that. Being thick called a weasel by a politician <laughs> is thick really... Thick, I'm huh? your friend. Thick or thin pizza. Um, I like New York style pizza where the oil drips off the end. Uh-huh. But in Chicago, between thick and... F- um, I have to go thick. I knew you would give the most embellished answer on a food question there. Uh, fourth is uh, Hancock or Sears or Willis Tower. Well, I stare at the Hancock Tower because I live over there, so mm-hmm. I'll, I'll choose that. Okay. 16-inch or 12-inch softball? Well, I like 16-inch. Uh, I broke my finger playing first base when I was in college at 16-inch, and one thing I learned is when you're playing 16-inch and someone wings the ball at you, <laughs> better to let it go by. <laughs> David Axrod, Chicago Stories. Great to be with you, brother. And good luck. You're listening to Chicago Stories with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. You can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet your guest ideas using hashtag ShyStories. Thanks for listening. <laughs>